Hi, this is Dr. Churchill returning for Astronomy 308 into the final frontier. And we are the second lecture into our space race module, module number two. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Cold War and we're going to talk about rocketry in the Cold War and really what drove the development of rocketry um, in the um, 1950s into the 1960s. Okay, so, um, let me share my slides. Okay, hopefully you can see this. And um, what we have here is my opening slide for a lecture called Cold War Rocketry, Transitioning Humanity into Our Brave New World, if you will. And um, what I'm showing here on the left is a typical picture from the 1950s. Now you can see him at this point in time, rockets were really well established and were really a big deal. So um, they were being built like basically hotcakes. And in fact, in, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev had argued that in fact, uh, they could make them as fast as they could uh, make sausages. And of course that scared the United States quite a bit. You know, by the time the 80s rolled around, uh, we had thermonuclear bombs on the, on the ends of uh, these rockets that could be launched at sea uh, with no warning from submarines. And so this was, you know, we're gonna park right off the coast of your country and um, basically nuke your city and you won't have more than three minutes to know what's coming. It was a, a horrifying situation uh, it's a situation that hasn't really changed. Uh, the, the submarines are still sailing the, the seven seas, if you will. And this idea of a mushroom cloud that looms over a city was a tremendous fear of the 1950s. Uh, we really, uh, after World War II, had a highly polarized world and they were polarized um, with, with their hands at each other's throats, if you will, the Soviet Union and the United States. And, you know, uh, with the one wrong turn and a nuclear bomb could easily have been launched uh, across the world. So what we're gonna find is that rockets were built as a weapon for war that started in uh, World War II as an actual uh, functional weapon. And then was, rapidly invested in in the 1950s. Um, and then eventually this madness that was happening uh, had to go one way or the other. It had to become basically a nuclear race in space um, or it was going to, space was going to be um, used for civilian type of explorations. And um, a brilliant young president President Kennedy uh, successfully wrestled this race out of the military's hands and put it into a civilian race. It was probably one of the most important things that happened in the 20th century and led to one of the crowning achievements of all humanity, which was to send humans to the moon. So let's go back and talk about, you know, World War I, World War II, and then the, and the subsequent Cold War that came out of that. So here we have um, what I'm gonna call rocketry and geopolitical forces. All right, we've talked a little bit about World War I and World War II. I'm gonna review them very, very briefly here, but this is you know, a post-industrial revolution. It reshaped the world map. As you saw, the Ottoman Empire was you know, eradicated and, and uh, the Middle East was carved up by the Western powers. There was this tremendous disillusionment of humanity because we, as we entered the 1900s, there was really this feeling, at least for what I'm going to call the first world countries, which were the ones that were the imperialistic colonizers, that they felt that they were approaching a world of utopian and social perfection. This was really a powerful idea and it set the stage um, for the demise of the chokehold of colonization this war did. And that was very, very key. Then World War II came along 
And um, it was a direct outcome of World War I for a lot of reasons that we won't go into, but I do believe that um, you've seen the, the World War I and World War II short videos uh, that I um, had you watch for the previous module. And if you didn't get a chance to go re, you know, watch those, I really suggest you do because they set up everything about the space race. And uh, honestly, you really can't understand the space race without understanding what drove World War II to happen, what happened in World War II and what the outcome of World War II was. Speaking of outcomes, the outcomes was a rocket race, a nuclear bomb race, and two superpowers that were highly polarized for total influence over the world. Just a, a not a good combination of things. So this led to what's called the Cold War. So-called cold because the two superpowers never directly went to war with one another and certainly never went to war in, in a nuclear level. But there were hot spots all around the globe in which the Soviet Union or the United States backed um, one um, adversary or the other in those conflicts in order to gain influence and control. And um, to some degree, more so than previous, where there was the idea of gaining control, but in this case, it was also to stem the tide of the other um, power gaining that control. So during this period, we have this perfecting of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are basically rockets that are designed to carry nuclear warheads from Moscow to Washington or Washington to Moscow. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly at the very end of this lecture about how this doomsday clock was born uh, out of this idea of mutual assured destruction, a, a name that came up in the 1970s called MAD. Um, and somewhere in all of this, the space race happened. And this is the story of um, President Kennedy and how he wrestled this, this madness out of the hands of uh, spinning out of control. So your brief, brief, brief uh, review of World War I, 1914 to 1918, we had major uh, empires that were battling it out trying to maintain control. Uh, this is right after the, the rush for colonization around the planet. Uh, the United Kingdom was, uh, or I should say, England was at the, the peak of its empire around this time. And uh, after that, the, there was a lot more segregation of powers throughout Europe and um, the big empires were dismantled and broken up into their own countries. So this, um, this led to a lot of tension uh, for Germany because the post-war uh, treatment of Germany by the allied countries that had defeated Germany and Austria um, really developed this harsh treaty called the Treaty of Versailles in which they asked Germany to pay all the reparations for all of the damage that happened in France. And then of course, um, we're gonna find out that the well, we're just gonna say that the, the, the depression hit, the stock market hit, and then that developed a lot of inflation and it developed a lot of uh, poverty in Germany and caused a great deal of struggle. Political factions grew up vying for power and finally the Nazis took control, Hitler took control in 1933 and started World War II in 1939. And if you look at, 1943 to 1944, which is near the peak of German power, you can see that Germany had control of Norway and Finland and this whole um, Poland region coming into the so Soviet Union. And then uh, they eventually had to take over Italy when Italy fell. But you can see here that this is quite a lot of power and development they had and they, um, the beauty of having so much land like this is that they had control of oil fields and raw resources, and they could really basically support their war effort through having access to natural resources. And one of the things of the war was to take the land away that had these natural resources as early as possible to stop 
um, Germany from having the ability to, to um, make war. Um, once the United States and the Soviet Union really started to invade uh, and push into Germany, um, you can see what happened here. You basically have the, the allies uh, taking up Italy, coming in through France and Spain and the Western German area and coming in here through Turkey and Greece. And you have the Soviet Union coming down here and taking Poland and these Eastern countries. And you have this line in the sand that gets drawn after World War II is over. And this becomes as Winston Churchill called the Iron Curtain. Now, Borston had used the word Iron Curtain in the past, uh, speaking of the Ottoman Empire when it took power after the Mongolians fell and the, Mong and the Ottoman Empire came up through Turkey and the uh, Slavic land here in the East and basically stopped the Europeans from being able to uh, trade with the East again. So this Iron Curtain idea coming up through um, Europe is, is uh, cyclic. In a, in a way. Okay. Um, so what happened was that the Germany got sliced up after World War II. That's all, that's basically all there is to it. And so this is the, the Germany at the time um, that the war ended. Uh, these are the borders that existed before the war started. And you can hear, see here's Czechoslovakia and here's Poland. Down here is Austria. Um, here's Switzerland, and here's France and Belgium. And so um, the British took this zone of Western Germany and this lower zone, and the uh, United States took this purplish zone here, and the French took this zone. And they, in a sense, carved up Germany and, and took control of these areas to uh, govern it and get it back to becoming um, what the Western powers wanted to be, which was a democracy. The Russians ended up having this Eastern zone of Germany, and this became known as East Germany, and this zone here as well. And you'll notice that the city of Berlin is actually embedded deeply into the center of East Germany. And the city itself of Berlin was then divided into a, a Soviet satellite, the United States, a Great Britain, and a France satellite region. And this part here along Berlin through the city uh, was an area where uh, a lot of East Berliners would flee to the United States, Great Britain or France side of the city because of the suppression that they felt under the communist regime. So the communists uh, built a wall known as the Berlin Wall along this line. Here's a, here's a picture of it right now. Now, most of you have, um, not lived during a time when the Berlin Wall existed. Uh, it fell in 1989. Um, I was in college at the time, and it was built in 1963, which is a year after I was born. So much of my period, that period of my life was dominated by knowing about the Berlin Wall and the horrors of people trying to escape um, and get out of Eastern Berlin to get into West Berlin. That was one of their best chances to um, get out of the Soviet uh, sphere of influence. Uh, I think in all, some 140 people uh, had been shot trying to cross through this wall. So this, this gives you a, a feeling, this wall gives you a feeling that the suppression in, at least from the United States point of view, the suppression of the people, um, the way they felt about living under the communist regime of the Soviet Union was not favorable. They, they wanted to um, leave that lifestyle. So let's go back in time and just get right into this rocketry stuff uh, in Germany. Now, um, last time that in our previous lecture, I showed you this picture down on the left with um, um, Hermann um, Oberth leading the VFR, and then a young 17-year-old um, von Braun uh, getting on a train from Prussia and going out to Berlin and becoming a part of uh, the VFR at a young age. And it turned out that 
somewhere in the early 30s, mid, mid early 30s, that the army started to take notice of these rockets that were being built. And young Werner von Braun was fairly idealistic and impressionist, um, impressionable. And there was a general by the name of Walter Dornberger. And Walter Dornberger had basically uh, searched through the people in the VFR and found that von Braun was very interested in working for uh, the army to build more and bigger, powerful rockets. And the reason really was is because if you have a dream of building something and somebody comes along with basically a bottomless pocket of money and facility uh, and says, you can be in charge of all these people and, and build these facilities, uh, a young person who's ambitious is, is going to go after it. And that's what Werner von Braun did. He was opportunistic in that way. The thing was, though, is that von Braun really was about, you know, the dreams of human space travel. And it turned out that Dornberger, the general, uh, felt that way as well. So even though he was, he was working for the Nazis as a, a general in their army, um, he was known to have uh, share this vision with von Braun. And they, they were a really good team in that way. Now, that's not to say that he didn't follow his orders and do his, do, you know, make sure that things were done according to the army way. But um, when, rock, when the first rockets were being launched and, and re they reached space, um, then Dornberger actually made a, a very eloquent speech about unlocking the uh, keys to the universe for humanity, even though he was building uh, in charge of building a weapon of destruction. Now, what, um, what they did was they eventually moved von Braun and his team up to a facility here that you see called Pinamunde. And this is up in the northern area of, uh, of Germany and was meant to be a very quiet, serene, uh, isolated location where they could launch their rockets and be away from big civilizations and, and the prying eyes of the Soviets and the prying eyes of the um, United States and its allies. Here's von Braun when he's about 27 years old. And this is a, the year when um, uh, 1939 is the year that World War II started. I'm not sure the exact date of this uh, photo, but I think it's taken right around that time when he was still quite young. And then toward the end of the war, uh, in 1944, you see also Werner von Braun here. And I just want to emphasize how young he is to be in charge of you know, thousands of people and managing everything from the logistics to the building to the design and uh, coordinating the launches and being liaison with the uh, Nazi military. Quite an astonishing young man. Now, the big day for space is marked as October 3rd, 1942. This is the first time a rocket was launched that successfully reached the boundary of space. This rocket, I believe, um, reached about 118 miles up straight. And the, the borderline for space is considered to be 100 miles. You can see <laughs> that this was the wild west of rocketry. You could actually stand up near the rocket, even if it was completely fueled. They, they just didn't have any regulations in those days. But here's a picture of the one V2 rocket that was launched on October 3rd of 42 that actually reached space. Excuse me. Now, on the right here, you can see a schematic. And every rocket is really based upon this fundamental design. And that fundamental design is that you basically have a fuel like alcohol and water or maybe hydrogen. And this is the fuel that actually is volatile, that, that will undergo a chemical reaction that will release tremendous amounts of energy and heat the gas, which then once it's heated to super hot temperatures, um, exits out the nozzle at high velocity. And as we saw from the rocket equation, the higher velocity that that exits back the, the back out of the um, the thrust exits out of the rocket, that the faster the rocket will pick up speed. Now, um, the other thing that's required because 
eventually these rockets uh, will either be flying high in the atmosphere or in space itself. So you can't have uh, oxid oxidization or, or combustion um, in space because you don't have the oxygen. You know, in a, in a, in a room, if you have a fuel and you light a flame to it, it, the oxygen in the air actually is what chemically bonds to help release the, the energy, say in a fire. So what they do is they actually have pure liquid oxygen stored in the lower tank. It's called the oxidizer. And really what you do is you pump, you pump your fuel down into this uh, chamber and you pump your liquid oxygen down in there and you ignite it. And then kabami, uh, you basically have your fire and you end up jettisoning your fuel out the bottom. Now, so then you want basically um, a payload um, that is being carried by the rocket. So the, the nozzle, or nozzle, the uh, top here um, of the, is basically a payload that carries something like a, a warhead of some sort. And in the case of the V2, it did carry uh, some 1,600 pounds of explosives. Okay. Now, in the old days, they weren't very good at guidance, so they actually uh, created these little fins that would channel the thrust a little bit so that they could control it. And then they had fins on the rocket, which also would help steer it, especially through the atmosphere. If you, you can uh, fly it a little bit like they do with the ailerons on airplanes. Um, as rockets became more sophisticated, people started using something called the gyroscope and using the principle of the conservation of angular momentum of spinning masses. Um, and then they would be able to control the uh, direction of the rocket that way. And I won't go into the details of that physics, but it's really fascinating stuff. Um, okay, so this rocket can travel uh, about 200 miles. It could go about 3,600 miles per hour, which is about one and a half times the sp speed of a bullet. And uh, as I said, it delivered up to 1,600 pounds of explosives. Oh, um, let's see, 1,400 or so were actually launched at London. Um, that's quite a few, but they were developed late in the war. As you can see uh, the first success was in 1942, but by the time they were able to mass produce them and then move them through um, to the coastlines of Europe so that they could launch them over to England. Uh, that took another year or so, and by then the, the war was turning badly for the Nazis. Um, in a sense, this became the, the, the first intercontinental ballistic missile because um, it wasn't able to go 7,000 miles around the world, but it could go a good um, 200 miles, which got it over from you know, one continent to an island. It's the progenitor of all modern rockets. Um, let's see, I think overall 3,000 V2s uh, were launched uh, throughout the war. London, of course, took some, almost half of those and a total of 9,000 people met their death. Um, before the V2 was launched, uh, Werner von Braun and his team had made something called the V1, which was kind of a, a, a buzz bomber. And it actually made enough noise and wasn't supersonic, so you could hear it coming. And uh, people in London would, would hear that. And then they knew that when the engine cut off, that it was then ready to just sort of fall out of the sky and land wherever it did and explode. And so people would hear that. And when they heard the engine cut off, that's when they would be worried about what's going to happen. But because they saw it coming, they would know somewhat how to hide and where to hide. With the V2, there was no warning. It was moving faster than the speed of sound and it would come in and people said, if you heard the V2 explode and you weren't dead, then you were gonna be okay. And, and so that was really a, a terrorizing weapon. Now, as part of what you'll read in the Space Race book is about something called Project Paperclip. And the story of how von Braun escapes uh, Nazi Germany to be, um, in a sense, captured by the American army is a fantastic story of bravery uh, as a real, um, you know, knuckle, white knuckle story and um, fingernail chewing situation for anybody who doesn't have the 
I don't know, the makeup to live through something like that. You know, at one point he had 10 orders on his desk that said, if you move the rockets out of Pina Monday, you will be shot. And he wanted to move the rockets out of Pina Monday because he could hear the Russian artillery coming. And they didn't want the rockets to go into the Soviet Union's hands and become their weapons. Uh, and then he had 10 orders on his desk that said, if you don't move the rockets and get them out of there, you'll be shot. So you know, he had to pick one or the other. And they decided to try to escape. They, they took all the important papers. They took all the important parts and all the rockets, and they moved them down south and to the west toward the American lines. And they, they had to do this at night. They had to paint their trucks with special things. They had to go through checkpoints and sweat out whether they were gonna get called out with their fake mission. It is really an amazing story. And then eventually Werner von Braun finds himself in the hands of the American army. And they decide we have got to grab all of the brains and we have to grab all of the papers and we have to grab all of the rocket parts. And it was really a race to the finish. Sometimes they grab things only hours before the Soviets would take occupation of these areas. It's just, I mean, it's like out of, you know, a movie or something. Um, a couple of Americans were then assigned with deciding who gets to come to America and help the Americans use this rocket technology. So about 150 of these Germans were selected and they, a, a, a dossier was made for each of them, a folder, which contained all their history and information, their education, what they'd done, what they'd done with the Nazis, what they'd done before the Nazis, um, what their role were, you know, how, um, how they contributed to the overall project, how essential they were. And 150 of them were selected in the way that they were chosen or it was indicated that they were chosen to come was that a paper clip would be put on the, uh, on the papers of their dossier. And so that it got renamed or named the operation paperclip and 150 of these files had the paper clips on them. And these people shown in this photo here uh, were quietly brought to the United States and they were quietly brought to Fort Bliss in El Paso. So this is a photograph taken in 1946 in Fort Bliss. I have circled Von Braun's photograph here, but basically he brought the key creme de la creme of his rocket team. And the idea was grab all these rocket scientists, grab all of their rockets and grab all of their technical diagrams, and get them to the United States. So now you might recognize this uh, territory here. This is White Sands, and this is the mountains uh, of the desert just over on the Toro Rosa Basin. And you can see that they have uh, a captured V-2 rocket, and they were running these missile tests right here across uh, the Oregon Mountains uh, as early as 1946, and did many of these tests all the way through 1950. And the uh, Von Braun team uh, actually was in El Paso and living on Fort Bliss through all of these years. So this is project uh, or Operation Paperclip, and it was a key component of um, post-war balance. To, this was a great uh, strategic victory for the United States. Now you're gonna find that the Soviet Union did something very similar to Project Paperclip. Um, where they came into Germany, they collected all of the scraps that were left over and, and they used them very, very effectively. They took the remaining rocket scientists back to the Soviet Union and they basically had them teach them how to build rockets. And, uh, and then many of them um, didn't survive that uh, or were repatriated into Germany, East Germany. Now, speaking of this individual who was involved in collecting the German rocket information and uh, the uh, German rocket scientists, it was this uh, gentleman by the name of Sergei Karlov. Um, and Sergei Karlov um, was a young man who was involved with rocket clubs early in his youth as much as Werner von Braun was. They called their rocket group GERD, 
which stood for the group studying reactive motion. Um, and reactive motion is the application of Newton's third law, which uh, is, you know, that um, forces that are equal and opposite to each other uh, will always play out. And so if you push on one force, it will, uh, with something with a force, it will push back with an opposite and equal force. So the force of the gas going out of the back of the rocket is the force that pushes the rocket forward, reactive motion. So the rocket's reacting to the motion of the exhaust. So that's why they got their name that way. And here's uh, Sergei Karlov as a young man in his early 20s. And here he is in his mid 20s. And then you could see him here in his mid 30s. And so this young man uh, was an aeronautical engineer and very talented, very driven. Um, like Tsiolkovsky, he had a very disrupted uh, childhood and that caused him to be somewhat uh, introverted. And so he spent a lot of time learning on his own and having a lot of dreams. And once he grew up with all of that background and all that dreaming, he was able to really do some great things. Now, the other thing about Sergei Karlov, which is very much like Werner von Braun, was that he was a great manager and leader of people. And this is also part of their tremendous success in, in pushing these two powers forward, Werner von Braun in the United States and Sergei Karlov, the Soviet Union. Here he is as a young man, and you can see the type of rockets that they were building and uh, the fact that they had their own rocket club as well. Okay, um, now the thing about Sergei Karlov is that he lived in the Soviet Union and at the time um, that post-world, early post-world war and um, between the wars in the, was, uh, Stalin was in charge of the Soviet Union and he purged a lot of people to Siberia, put them in labor camps or basically had them outright shot. And um, it turned out that uh, Sergei Karlov was one of these people and he was accused of sabotaging the progress of the Soviet Union in in developing rocketry and um, its aeronautics uh, before World War II started. So um, here's a picture of him as mugshot before he goes to prison. And uh, he miraculously uh, survived. Um, one of the reasons he died so early was the horrible condition that his body was in from malnutrition. And I think he lost all his teeth um, and things like this. But even then, when he was released, he went back and worked for the Soviet Union with all of his passion and all of his might and made them uh, a superpower in, in, in the space field world. So um, here's a picture of Sergei Korolov pretty much at the peak of his powers. Um, well, actually, at the peak of his powers probably were in the, in the early 60s, but building up to that point, here he is out in um, the desert area that became Star City for the Soviet Union, a, a dismally, horribly isolated place in the Soviet Union where he launched and tested his rockets. So this is a little timeline of biography of Sergei Karlov. And um, once the Cold War started, the Soviet Union was so afraid that the United States would assassinate uh, Sergei Korolev that he was only discussed and uh, identified as the chief designer. And his identity was kept completely secret from the population of the Soviet Union and the world. Only the, the highest level people in the Soviet government knew who he was. Um, this is in stark contrast to uh, Werner von Braun, who was kind of a folk hero in the United States. He wrote all kinds of popular articles in the 50s. He was on TV with Walt Disney during the Walt Disney days. And uh, he was very, very famous. And then, of course, he was known as a legend in his own time for building the rocket that sent astronauts to the moon. But let's look at this other story of Sergei Korolev. Um, so, in 31 and 38, he's working with these uh, rocket clubs and stuff like that. And in 38, which is just before World War II starts, 
he purges, uh, Stalin purges the rocket scientists. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later uh, when we talk about the Soviet Union in some more detail about Valentin Glusko, um, but he was an engine builder and he got arrested. And then of course, in order to not just be shot on the spot, you had to denounce somebody else. So he denounced Korolov. So Korolov then got arrested. Well, you can imagine that Korolov was not too friendly to Glusko for the rest of his life for pulling that stunt. Um, so anyway, Korolov was arrested and sent to a gulag for 10 years doing hard labor. And the two men remained bitter rivals ever after. And it's really too bad for the, the history of the Soviet Union because Korolov was the, the great rocket designer and Gusko was the great engine designer. And it turned out that Soviet rockets ended up failing because um, Glusko Korolov didn't want his engines from Glusko. He got, he got them from another area of the army and they just weren't as good. I was having trouble getting that out. Okay, in 1944, after the war is basically over, almost over, uh, Korolov is released from prison and is promoted as a team leader for rocket scientists. Uh, he's just like that promoted and then given three days to propose the Soviet equivalent of a German V2. In other words, you know, just put it on the drawing board and let's get moving. In 45, he's sent to Germany to assess the hardware technicians and all the residual leftover from the project paperclip from the United States. And he, and sometimes they say, was, you know, within audible range of the Americans and their campfires. Uh, they, they were so close to each other as they tried to secretly grab these materials in the dead of night. In 46, st still considered under watch by the government, uh, he was promoted to a chief engineer. He was charged with designing the, the equivalent of the V2, and he built something that was called the R R1 rocket. And today, it's still known as the Scud missile. Um, that's, a, that's a NATO code name. And, um, NATO is something we'll talk about later in this lecture, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a coalition of countries uh, meant to suppress the communist um, influence in the world. And fast forward about eight years here to about 1953, and he begins development of something that he calls his R7 rocket. And uh, this is a, a, a true intercontinental ballistic missile um, and it's based upon multiple stages, like uh, Herman Oberth's original PhD thesis. And it's supposed to be able to have a range of 7,000 kilometers, which basically means that it has enough range to go from the Soviet Union over the North Pole and hit Washington. And um, that was the idea, was that it's supposed to carry a nuclear payload and um, be a delivery system. In 1957, in August, after a great deal of work and a lot of failures, um, he successfully launched the R-7 rocket. Now, he knew what he wanted to do with that R-7 rocket, which here's a diagram of it in the middle of the uh, slide deck here. He wanted to send people to space and put up satellites. Of course, the, the government, uh, let run now by Khrushchev, this gentleman over here who's uh, got the hat on and is screaming uh, at you. Um, he wanted it to deliver nuclear bombs. Now, the thing was that um, Korolov knew that if he put something lighter than a nuclear bomb as the payload, that he could have enough residual thrust and power left over that he could put this payload into orbit and make the first human-made satellite. And so in October of 1957, he launched Sputnik, the first Sputnik called Sputnik 1. And this really shook the world and it shook it hard. Now, one of the things I want you to realize is in the days leading up to Sputnik, nations were not allowed to fly into each other's airspace. And so, you know, you couldn't just take your spy plane and fly across the Soviet Union and take pictures and you'd get shot down. Same thing the other way around. Even today, there are these, you know, uh, each country has its own airspace and you have to have permission 
to fly in that airspace. Once Sputnik went up in space, it was able to go over the United States every 90 minutes, every 90 minutes. And so all of a sudden now, there's no time, there's no ability for anybody to negotiate about whether there's airspace or space space above each nation. That is completely moot now and precedent has been set. And all you have to do is put a spy camera in Sputnik and it can take pictures of anything it wants to anywhere in the world at any time over any country. And this was not missed by the president of the United States at the time, which was uh, Eisenhower. So this just completely freaks the country out. And it actually also caused the country to completely revamp the education system to get people to do science. And, and it became, if you were a student in the late 60s, you worked your butt off because you, you had to take math, you had to take heavy duty uh, physics and engineering. And they put all of these heavy classes into high school and assigned great deal amount of homework um, in the 60s. So that was a very tough decade if you were a student, but also a great decade if you wanted to learn and uh, become very knowledgeable. Anyway, there's um, a, a huge movement for the education system in the United States. It really changed the culture of education in the United States. And I'm mentioning that because it's only one one area of response where the whole nation had a whole new movement that was based as a reaction of Sputnik because Sputnik was a challenge. It basically said, we are behind the Soviet unions in technology. They have won the day, they have the high ground, okay? So this is an image here of the R7 actually carrying Sputnik, a very historic photograph. This is um, an art, I'd say it's a, a computer graphic image of uh, Sputnik overlaid in front of the earth. There, we really don't have any pictures of Sputnik like this, but this is a really beautiful image of what Sputnik must have been like uh, flying, um, or I should say orbiting the earth. Its orbit was about 134 to 580 miles high. The uh, length of the orbit was a little bit over an hour and a half, 90 minutes, and it conducted, it uh, flew about 1,440 orbits before it actually decayed and uh, out of its orbit or lost its radio battery. Um, it weighed about 183 pounds, so like a human, uh, it was about a, a sphere of foot in diameter. The only thing that was within, uh, inside of it as a payload was the radio. And um, the flight lasted about nine, or sorry, three months. This is um, a schematic of the radio here and the, the battery, it's a very large battery, um, and then something to cool it. And then here's the radio here, which is a small transmitter. The transmitter basically just made a beep sound, you know, beep, beep, something like that. And it was beeping at a radio frequency that was right smack in the middle of the radio band where the amateur radio people, the ham operator, ham radio operators, uh, their frequency range. And ham radio was very popular in the 1950s. And you had these groups of people in all of the cities spread out throughout the nation and they had these ham radio clubs. And they could tune their radios and they could hear Sputnik come overhead and leave. And you could just, one city to the next would pick it up and they could track it across the United States. So a lot of people would come to these ham radio people to hear Sputnik because it was, it was really the thrill of a lifetime. You know, there's one of those events that you probably don't forget where you were when you heard about it. So this is a classic uh, moment where you have a ham uh, radio operator and this uh, photograph put in a newspaper showing that, you know, he's showing them how you can hear Sputnik. This apparently was at a state fair in Texas. So it made the headlines of all the newspapers throughout the world. Um, you can see the New York Times, Soviet, Soviets fire Earth satellite into space, circling the globe at 18,000 miles per hour, tracked in four crossings over the US. Here you can see the orbit. It's kind of going over the pole slightly. The Earth is turning underneath it. 
And then, of course, space age is here. Russia wins the race to outer space. Red moon over London. You know, um, there goes a man-made moon. It's just everywhere. And then, of course, uh, the analysts got on the news. You know, how is it going to affect the United States? How is it going to change things? And then um, I, I really can't tell you how this really freaked out the nation and changed everything. And it really was the beginning of the space race. It, it truly was. And it's the, uh, the moment in which the United States woke up and realized that they really had to get their act together because space was the new ocean to sell and it was the new high ground. So one of the problems that happened was a lot of pressure got put on um, Eisenhower and Khrushchev, uh, the Soviet premier, of course, got on the radio waves, got on TV, went to the UN, the United Nations, and said all this great stuff that how great their missiles were and how many hundreds of them they had, even though he was lying through his teeth. And of course, Eisenhower couldn't show anything. Um, the reason was is that Eisenhower uh, had to keep all of the, the US missiles secret. And it turned out that technically, when it came to missiles, we actually were more advanced than the Soviet unions. What we didn't have was a missile or rocket that was as powerful as the R-7. And it is a very simple reason why the R-7 was so amazingly powerful and had so much thrust. And that is because they needed to build it to lift a nuclear warhead, a nuclear bomb, 7,000 kilometers around the globe. The nuclear bombs that the Soviets made were very bulky and very heavy. And the, the rocket designers, Sergei Korolov, was told by the nuclear bomb scientists, you need to be able to lift a five ton bomb 7,000 kilometers. So Sergei Korolov realized how much power he needed in order to do that and built an extremely powerful rocket. Our bombs were like one fifth of the mass of the nuclear bombs that were, were used by the Soviet Union. So our lift capability um, to launch a one ton object to the Soviet Union was not as powerful of a rocket. And it turned out that you, you really couldn't use these rockets to uh, put something into orbit that, that really required as much power as an R7 rocket had. So Eisenhower was really under the gun. And he thought, well, I better do something about this that's very visible. And what did he do? He created NASA. Okay. Um, now, the thing about this is that um, Eisenhower was kind of not all that impressed by Sputnik. He tried to play it down and blah, blah. But a month later, uh, on November 3rd, literally a month later from October when they launched Sputnik 1, the Soviets launched another satellite. So they turned around and did it again, which makes you think they've got a lot of rockets. It makes you think they've got all the, the um, you know, logistics to, to make lots of rockets, to launch lots of rockets. I got people trained to go uh, and launch these rockets and build these rockets. And this satellite weighed 1300 pounds. Now that got their attention because that's quite a large payload to put into orbit. And it contained a living animal, which means that there was, you know, a um, a life support system uh, on the spacecraft as well. And this just really blew Eisenhower away, really thinking, "Wow, that the next step is they're going to put a human in orbit." So the USA at this point was double flabbergasted, if you will. And so Eisenhower. Instead of seeing that as a stunt, saw that as a true stepping stone to, to humans being in orbit above the United States, orbiting around once every hour and a half, looking down and maybe able to drop a nuclear bomb. He decided that we needed to put humans in space and we needed to develop the technology to put humans in space. So to do this, he dissolved the NACA, which was the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. Uh, which had been around since 1915. He dissolved it, took all of its assets, all of its 
bases, all of uh, the, the, the facilities, uh, like which now became Ames Research Center or Langley NASA Research Center. All of those things were converted to NASA. And this happened on October 1st, 1958, just about a year after Sputnik was launched. And the goal that NASA was given on its birth was to put a man in space soonest. They called it MISS, M-I-S-S. So the directive for NASA was get a human being in space and do it as soon as possible. Man in space soonest. So anyway, that is the story of the birth of NASA and the story of Sputnik 2 and the story of why the Soviets had such a powerful rocket on their hands. Now, you can read in the space race, the, the, the very frustrating story of the United States trying to get a satellite in space. Now, it turns out that von Braun was talking about doing this in the mid 50s and early 50s. And, this, and he said, I've got a rocket. If you let me design it the way I want to, I will get a satellite in space. But the United States wasn't interested. I didn't want to waste resources on that as we said, Eisenhower saw that as a stunt. And they just didn't want to waste the resources on it. So they're putting all the resources into, into nuclear bombs and trans, uh, flying nuclear bombs on ICBMs. Now, uh, so Von Braun's hands were tied behind his back. In this and then of course, Sputnik happened. And so of course, they call him up and say, Hey, Werner, you know, can you help us out here? And he says, I've already got it on the drawing board. In fact, I got one already built in the back here. We're ready to go. But, you know, what the government did was it said, well, we got we have to shop this around to all the different militaries. So they got a proposal from the army, which would fly Braun stuff. They got a proposal from the Navy and they got, you know, a proposal from the Air Force. Excuse me. And, you know, what happened, of course, was they said, look, we're going to go into orbit here. This is going to be a huge moment for the United States. We can't look back and say the Germans did it for us. You know, the, the German rocket scientists that we stole from Germany after the war, we can't let them be the ones. Do we have to make this a United States endeavor? So they gave the contract to the Navy. And the Navy tried a couple of times with something called Project Vanguard. Now, their rockets would go up about two feet fall back to the pad and explode. And there was a highly publicized, it was on live national television, launch of the Vanguard, and it did exactly this. And the, the payload, which was a radio transmitter, fell out, rolled off the pad into the bushes at Cape Canaveral and commenced to do its beeping laying there on the ground. And it got ridiculed by the press to no end. Um, it was named things like State Putnik, Kaputnik, all kinds of stuff. Finally, the United States got desperate. They said, okay, Werner and Army, you can, you can do this uh, launch if you want. So this is his rocket. It's called the Jupiter C. And it was a four-stage rocket. The fourth stage was what really gave it that extra boost to get up into orbit. And they launched it in the late January of 58. And this is the uh, satellite itself. It's called the Explorer. And the thing about the Explorer that was different than Sputnik was that it had the first scientific instrument on it. And so instead of just setting up something that was going to beep and, and tell the world that we had made it, they actually wanted to see if they could perform some science. The instrument that was built was a magnetometer. It was built by James Van Allen. And that magnetometer actually picked up high doses of radiation around two belts of the earth and it became known as as the van allen belts and here they're showing in red and and, and green and so as the rock the, the the satellite really was very um close to the earth i don't want you to get the impression that it was uh orbiting at these kinds of distances but um it was orbiting very close to the earth here but these van allen belts actually stretched down lower they were barely detected in um, the outskirts or um, the peripheral regions of the Van Allen belts. Um, of course, that evening after they had uh, got the rocket up, uh, they were in Pasadena and James Pickering, who was a leader at JPL, 
James Van Allen, who built the magnetometer, and Werner von Braun, who had been the leader of the development of the rocket, were celebrated, made it onto the national news. And then, of course, uh, Time magazine featured each of them for their accomplishments of making this first space satellite. Now, let's talk about the Cold War for a little bit, because this really was going on during all this time. And um, what I'm showing you here is a picture of the globe showing you uh, the, the Iron Curtain here in Europe and then the Soviet uh, influence, sphere of influence here. And you can even see North Korea over here. And then you can see over here, the United States and its allies in blue. And um, I think this view of the globe is really good because it gives you a feeling for the proximity of the United States uh, and Washington and Moscow over the pole, which is a much shorter distance than going around the earth in this regard. Um, it's sort of at a constant latitude. Now, these are images from that period of time, and these uh, are real images. This is not just sort of your cherry-picked kind of thing. This was part of the, the way people lived, the, the culture that they lived. Uh, the first thing is um, missiles were really forefront in the mind of people. They, they, they were in the magazines, they were in the newspapers, people were aware of them. Um, missile launches were commonplace uh, in places like White Sands, so people that lived in areas like this were very aware of them. In our school system, and it was not kidding around, they actually had, you know, not fire drills, but nuclear bomb drills, you know, uh, duct tape the windows, duck and cover under your desk, close your eyes. Um, it, the, they really took this seriously because missiles were proliferating, nuclear bombs were prolifer proliferating, the uh, ICBMs were being set up in various countries around the world, you know, ready to go. Not to mention that the Air Force had a whole uh, group of pilots that their whole goal was to fly a plane pretty much one way and drop the nuclear bomb and then take off out like this and get as far away as they could, as fast as they could, and then parachute out behind enemy lines and try to escape. Um, that's how desperate they were to try to figure out ways to drop these nuclear bombs. Here is a, a picture in England. And you know, imagine growing up and the fear of adults for nuclear holocaust is so high that you're taught how to put on a gas mask and go down into a shelter underground. We don't live in a world like that right now, but this, I just want you to understand the reality of the fear that had, was gripping the world over this Cold War nuclear arms race and missile race that was happening. You, you could go down to your local uh, Lowe's store or Home Depot. I'm just joking, they didn't exist in those days, but you certainly could go to a, um, a manufacturing company uh, you couldn't just, you know, search on Amazon and buy it in those days, but you could buy a do-it-yourself shelter. And so I'm just going to say that the um, spacecraft payload contains a do-it-yourself shelter. Okay. And now um, people actually built these things to protect their families. And th this is no joking matter. And um, so here you can see they teach you everything about how to build it and put in the supplies um, and how to survive in there, come with a manual. And here's an example of one in a classic suburban home somewhere in the United States that I don't know much about. But, you know, here we are taking our children down in a drill to show them, you know, this is what we do if you see a flash in the, in the sky or we hear on the radio that a bomb has uh, gone off. So this is sort of the, the, the blue side of the coin, this um, culture that existed and the sphere that existed in, in the blue zones of the world. The red zones were a little bit different in that, that people were more indoctrinated into being part of the aggression rather than being a, um, passive um, and subjected to the aggression of this, of this age. So you can see, for example, that the Soviet Union was 
always flexing its Mars um, muscles. It was always flexing its muscles and you know showing its guns in a sense. And so you can see they would have these parades, show all of their missiles, parade them, make sure that the West was aware of these uh, uh, objects that they had built, these this powerful rockets. It was a time when many nuclear bombs were test detonated all throughout the planet. Um, there's an amazing video on YouTube that goes through all of the, the different nuclear bomb tests that were detonated throughout the world. And it's, it's a fantastic little video if you can search YouTube and find it. So here you have a situation where uh, people, normal citizens, are engaged in creating and making and manufacturing weapons. So this was very common um, that even, even women and children were uh, used for this effort. And so here we, we show an area where also we have a lot of women uh, contributing to this labor force. And there was a lot of stirred up angst and anger. So not only were, you know, on our side was there angst and anger um, about the Soviet Union, but, you know, we saw them as a, a sort of evil empire that suppressed the freedom of people and wanted to expand its influence. Which is weird because the Soviet Union really didn't have a history of colonial imperialism. So it really had built that power and was following that idea from our point of view uh, only in the, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and, and beyond. But if you look at this sign here and you think about everything we've learned in the sea race module about colonialism and imperialism that followed the sea race and the expansion of the Western powers around the globe, uh, look at these words. We are in unity with the colonial revolutionary masses. You know, we're, we're part of the, you know, we care about those people that have been colonized for the last 150 years by the West. We're with them, you know, and we will defeat imperialistic war. In other words, they saw us from, based upon the history of the Western world, they saw us as colonializers, exploiters, and imperialists. And they're not half wrong when you think about the whole history of the world from the perspective that we can look at it today. So it's not a situation where blue is right and red was wrong. It's really a question about what, what's your vision of what you think the future should look like. And more so, we should have come together on that. But we really had a tremendous distrust for each other, what our motives were, and what we would do if we had gained the upper hand. And the idea was we can't let red gain the upper hand. Red said we can't let blue gain the upper hand. So let's talk about this a little bit. Red versus blue, and I'm telling you, this was serious business. You know, uh, you didn't live during the Cold War and you didn't experience having to get under your desk and put on gas masks and your family building shelters around their houses, okay? But atomic bombs were proliferating in huge numbers and the power of them was getting greater and greater in their destructive ability. ICBMs were the new delivery system. They were being researched, tons of money poured in. They were developing, becoming more powerful as well. There was virtually no defense against these intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, once they were launched with a warhead and the warhead was made live, there was absolutely no stopping it. You couldn't stop it. And you only got about a 30 minute warning uh, if you had uh, early distance warning systems, meaning that you were able to have radars around the, the borders of the Soviet Union and you saw the missile coming, then you could figure out a trajectory and you could call Washington and say, you've got 30 minutes, okay? Um, from the United States perspective, from the blue perspective, if you will, the world was um, dangerously polarized and that we didn't want the Soviets uh, to aggressively expand their communism. The thing about the Soviets was they, um, they made their aims very clear. Uh, as you can see from Khrushchev here, he wasn't subtle about what he wanted to do. 
um, speaking of my background picture of the gentleman screaming his head off. Basically, I think that's when he said, we will bury you. All right. Uh, the post-World War II countries, this is very important. The post-World War II countries were basically economically devastated and their infrastructures were very devastated and they required assistance in order to be able to be strong enough to resist what we called the red tide. And so we infiltrated them with money through the Marshall Plan. We rebuilt them. We lined their borders with missiles that could launch nuclear warheads on Russia. And it really was a battle for each of these nations that were looking for help to uh, make themselves, to rebuild themselves. They could either look to the Soviet Union for their advice or their uh, money and uh, ideology, or they could look to the West, uh, the United States, for uh, money and their ideology. And so there was a, a war for the hearts and the minds of every one of these countries. Western Europe, that was pretty much going to be under the American influence uh, right away. But the rest of the world, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, South America, the Caribbean, these were up for grabs. The Philippines, these, these places were really uh, prey for the superpowers. Um, so whenever possible, it was up to the superpower to try to demonstrate why it was better. And being having the technology to fly satellites in space was one of the first things that the Soviet did, Union did to impress the world that, that said, you know what, that might be a better system. I mean, they're ahead of the United States in what is the crowning achievement, arguably, of humanity. So America worked very hard to contain uh, communism, and they came up with something called the domino theory. And their fear was that if country A fell, then country B next to it would fall, then country C next to it would fall, and you would basically get the spreading, uh, the falling domino effect of communism taking over the world. Turned out it was kind of a, a flawed theory. Uh, it led to a war in Korea, and it led to a war in Vietnam, and I'll show you on a map later, it led to a lot of hot spots around the globe. Um, now, in all of this, space was the high ground, okay? The military advantage of being um, in space was is pretty obvious, okay? In the sense that the having the, the strongest navy uh, in the 17 and 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, that having the strongest navy meant you had control of the planet. It's the same thing. If you have the most powerful rockets and the most powerful bombs and excuse me, have the ability to gain the advantage of covering uh, the, the high ground in space. It's obvious who's gonna control the planet. And we could have gotten into a serious race about that. Okay, why not park nuclear bombs into orbit and circle the globe with nukes? And you know we have a thousand of them flying over the Soviet Union every day and they have 950. So you know we're ahead, we're, we have the high ground. That, Fortunately, that, that never happened. And one of the reasons it didn't happen was because this race got taken out of the, the rocket race got taken out of the hands or the space race out of the hands of the, the military. We'll talk about that. Um, so one of the things about securing space also, not only do you protect yourself or have the ability to attack your number one arch enemy, but you have the ability to protect your allies too, and that gives you more sphere of influence uh, over the planet as well. And then um, again, these conditions could have led to this nuclear arms race, but they didn't. That brings us to the space race. So what I'm trying to do with this slide and the Cold War slide is really get you to understand how polarized and fearful the world was and how space was the high ground. Okay, it's different than the sea race in that regard. The sea race was really more about trying to gain control for God and gold and glory, mostly gold, and make your country powerful and, and everybody in the country rich and secure. Um, this was more fear driven, okay, fear of being basically wiped off the planet. It's, it's sort of had the opposite motivation 
of the sea race, but yet the understanding of having the high ground, that motive was very clear. Okay, so can we have a space race and not make it a nuclear arms race in space? As we develop into the space race, um, one of the things that happens is this um, additional polarization of the world and that this polarization started with uh, Western Europe and Turkey and the um, Scandinavian countries aligning together with Canada and the United States to form NATO. And this happened in 1949 in response to the detonation of an atomic bomb by the Soviet Union as a, a test. Um, six years later, the Soviet Union put together something called the Warsaw Pact and this was called the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Mutual Assistance. But effectively, this was, we're going to cover, scratch each other's back, and uh, we're going to use our buffer countries as uh, the place where we can put uh, missile silos and point them at Europe and, and uh, basically protect ourselves and uh, be ready to take the upper hand when necessary. Um, NATO and Warsaw, they, Pact. They, they never did go at war directly with one another, but these uh, institutions still exist today. And we have a, a, another line in the sand being drawn here uh, with complicated lines with country uh, borders. But, you know, this is not much different in some level than the modern day treaty of Tordesillas, where the Pope drew that line uh, down uh, the western part of the world here and split South America so that you had Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking areas of the, of the two uh, influences. But here we have two ma major powers that have split the world basically in two again. Apparently we like things black and white or red and blue and cut in two. I should start writing poetry. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to share with you that this is the kind of polarization that was happening. The sphere of influence uh, beyond the, the Warsaw Pact is uh, shown in here with the lighter shades. The US and its allies basically have the entire Western hemisphere except for a few small areas um, that were you know, kind of not really aligned with people. Africa, not really aligned. But the uh, Soviet Union and its allies, the sphere of influence uh, was all of this territory in Asia, Eastern Europe, Egypt, um, Iraq actually, and um, China turned communist in 1949. And so that was a huge uh, solidarity uh, for the communist sphere of influence. So in 49, China turned communist after that 20 year civil war in 53, North Korea and South Korea was split in two. Uh, that, that's a horrible war. Um, you know, first the, the, the red side came all the way down, then the blue side went all the way up, then the red side came halfway back down and there it stood. Um, and it's been a horrible split. And in 1954, Vietnam was split into the North and the South. And then we knew that we know that a horrible war happened there in the next decade. Um, and then in 1959, Cuba here actually turned communist after five years of civil uh, unrest and rebellion. And so now if you look at this map and you turn this spot red, uh, you're a little bit more worried about what could happen to the United States if the Soviet Union sunk some of their power into Cuba. And that did happen in the 60s. They brought missiles over there and set them up 90 miles from the coast of Miami and uh, they were uh, ready to be able to launch these missiles at Washington. Um, it almost caused World War III, it was very close. And in fact, there was a lot of missiles that the Americans had put in Turkey and along the Eastern border of Western Europe. And in order to get the Soviets to remove these missiles from Cuba, Kennedy agreed that he would remove some of the missiles that were along the border of the Soviet Union. So that ploy kind of worked. Uh, and uh, we avoided war in that, that was in 60, 62. It was uh, October of 1962. And um, I was born in November of 62. So I was nine months in the womb, uh, about to be born into World War III nuclear holocaust. 
Uh, thank you, President Kennedy and uh, the cooler minds of the Soviet Union, which prevailed. Uh, I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail. Um, I just want you to see that the Soviet Union and uh, the, the United States, or I should say the blue sphere of influence and the red sphere of influence had multiple areas where they had skirmishes or came to the brink of war. Um, here is the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis I spoke about. Um, so I'm not gonna go through each of these, but you can see the dates here. We've got uh, 62, 47 to 50, some communist rebels and, and, and Greece almost goes and falls. Uh, the Soviet Union shot down uh, a pilot in 1960 that caused a major uh, uh, freezing, uh, if you will, more, uh, more of the Cold War. Uh, we have Korea in 1950 to 53, Vietnam 57 to 75. Uh, here we have Britain helping Indonesia repel communist insurgents in 65, uh, Soviet Union struggling in the Congo, Congo and uh, these African countries here trying to take control of them. And then here the United States intervening on these governments to make sure they don't become communists and expand. Uh, so anyway, this was a, a clear sort of like hotspot, hotspot, hotspot around the globe in this attempt to keep each other at bay. None of these conflicts had to do with nuclear bombs and none of these conflicts had to do with the missile race or the space race. This is just what was going on around the world during this period of time. Okay, so now uh, when we, I'm gonna talk briefly about the history of the space race and its context here in the history. Um, and then when we come back for our next lecture, we're going to end up talking about Project Mercury and Project Gemini for the United States. So we're, we're, we're gonna first focus on the projects of the United States. Um, okay, so what's the deal here? Um, blue are defining historical events that you know, really set the tone for what was going on in the world. And then the selected major space achievements are in red and then things that have to do with science or engineering uh, are in black. So all the way back to the 1860s, uh, just after the Civil War in the United States, Jewel Verne's writes from the Earth to the Moon and a lot of time goes by We have the rocket pioneers being born in this area. The first flight of the Wright brothers, uh, World War I takes place 14 to 18 in the 1900s. Goddard launches his first fuel rocket here. This is the first time a rocket with liquid fuel has been launched. In 27, uh, Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. So you go from this sort of like, you know, 122nd flight uh, to uh, flying across the Atlantic here in just uh, a couple of decades. Then uh, World War II happens. And during World War II, a couple big things happened. The launch of the V-2 rocket by Werner von Braun, and then um, first rocket into space, and then the atomic bomb is detonated toward the end of that war. World War II ends, and we enter the Cold War era with the United States and USSR that lasts from 1945 until 1989. During this period of time, the space race really thickens. In 57, Korolev launches Sputnik, and in 1958, the United States launches Explorer 1. So we have our two first satellites by the two rival superpowers. Now, we're going to talk about this history, and this is probably the part you're going to enjoy in the coming lectures, is the, is the actual space missions that happened during this time. The first human in space was a Russian. His name was Yuri Gagarin, April 12, 1961, and uh, this is marked by this red line here. At that time, the United States had started its Project Mercury. Now, not shown on this timeline are the Vostok and Voskhod projects of the Soviet Union, but I'll be talking about those. This, is, this timeline's a bit, a bit US-centric. Project Mercury was the project of putting a human being and orbiting them around the Earth, just one person in that space capsule. And then um, after that was Project Gemini, which was flying two people into space, thus the Gemini as in twins. And this is really an amazing period. I'm really going to enjoy talking to you about Project Gemini because that's when we learned how to do space flight. 
We learned how to rendezvous. We learned how to dock. We learned how to do uh, spacewalks. I mean, everything happened in Project Gemini. It was the true wild west of spaceflight. And the Gemini astronauts were the true trailblazers of flying in space and learning how to fly spacecraft in space um, and pilot the, the, the spacecraft. Just a tremendous period of time, kind of forgotten and overshadowed by the project that followed it, which was Project Apollo. And somewhere about halfway through Project Apollo, Neil Armstrong got out and stepped foot on the moon, followed by Buzz Aldrin 15 minutes later. We then sent another six flights to the moon, and uh, we landed a total of 12 human beings on the moon. That stopped in 1973, actually December of 1972. Um, in 1975, um, Apollo, uh, an Apollo spacecraft and a Soyuz Russian spacecraft, Soviet spacecraft, the so Soviets launched from the Soviet Union and we launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida and they went into orbit and they docked and shook hands in orbit for the first time. And I like to mark that as the end of the space race, even though you might say that when Armstrong walked on the moon, some people say, well, we won the space race then. But I really think that the Soviet unions were still fighting against us. And I'll talk about that history and thinking about putting their own human on the moon. And it wasn't in time uh, until the 1975 that we, we actually decided to work together in space for the first time. 1981 is the first space shuttle. And so the, the space shuttle era lasts here from about 1981 to 2011. And during that time in 1986, we have our first space shuttle disaster. Then in 2003, we have our second space shuttle disaster. Um, the first Chinese human to uh, launch on a Chinese rocket from Chinese uh, uh, country and uh, uh, go to Earth orbit uh, was here in 2003, I think it was. And then the International Space Station was really being built in earnest and was uh, being manned uh, permanently on a round the clock basis, starting here in the late 2000s. Um, there's more to the story because we're up here at 2021. There are many, 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 many events that have happened here, but I'm trying to get you to understand the buildup of the Cold War the period of the Cold War, and right here in the center, the period of most tension of the Cold War, which was here building up in the 50s, and then during this period was the space race. And the reason all of these projects are about sending humans is because President John Kennedy stood before Congress and said, we are going to put a human on the moon. And threw the gauntlet down for the Soviet Union, they had to either play with that game with us or they had to be shown up by us. There was no third way. And um, we won it. And we forced the Soviet unions to take some of the resources and put them into putting humans on the moon as well, even though they denied it. This is a slide for your edification. Not all of you perhaps know the sequence of presidents of the United States during the Cold War period from 1945 until 1989. I think most of you know who Bill Clinton was and then George W. Bush following after that, Barack Obama and then uh, the latest uh, era of Trump and, um, and now uh, Biden. But before, uh, and most of you probably heard of Reagan, of course, he's a controversial figure and uh, was a very strong president and brought the United States uh, out of the 1970s through the 80s. And in the 70s, you had Carter, and before that, Ford, who uh, came into power after Nixon uh, resigned from Watergate. You probably also heard of Nixon. Before that was Johnson. Um, Johnson was the president really during the Vietnam War. Um, his decision-making really was responsible for how that war uh, escalated for the United States. Uh, before him, uh, who was assassinated in uh, 1963 was John F. Ken Kennedy. And you can see he was president only for two years. And yet in those two years, he uh, saved the United States and the world through the Cuban Missile Crisis 
uh, and, and, and keeping a cool head and, and not you know, letting that go to war because they say that that was right on the brink within you know, as close as you get. He also was around for the Berlin crisis, which I haven't described. And then um, he gave the moon speech, which we're gonna talk about a great deal. And so in his short tenure as president, uh, he, he was very busy. He also um, was involved in something called the uh, Bay of Pigs fiasco, which was um, a, a, an attempt to take back Cuba from the communists that, that failed miserably. And that was at the very beginning of Kennedy's president. So it, it didn't start out too smooth for him. Um, he came on the, uh, uh, after Eisenhower and Eisenhower really lost face with uh, Sputnik and the, the missile race and not having this uh, public face to space. And that was one of the things that brought Kennedy to power was saying you know, that he was gonna make us more powerful in space. Eisenhower was the commander of all the allied forces in World War II. So he was a, a, considered to be a great leader and he was also somewhat of a, an international hero. And before that was Truman who took over power from uh, Delano Roosevelt, who died during the, toward the very end of World War II in May of 1945, or, or uh, late April 1945 in that territory. Um, and then Truman was the person who decided that, that we were actually gonna go ahead and drop the atomic bomb uh, on Japan. And when he came to power, uh, even as vice president, he was not aware of the atomic bomb. It's pretty interesting. The Soviet Union, you know, we really don't know, um, as common knowledge, uh, nobody could whittle off all the premiers for the Soviet Union, but I just wanted you to be introduced to, to this fellow Stalin who helped get them through World War II. And he was a horrific murderer, uh, worse than, than Hitler ever was, yet he won. And so he wasn't considered the evil uh, person that Hitler was. Followed by Khrushchev, who was responsible for um, the, the space race and the missile race um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis followed by Brezhnev, who was the last person um, to really have a long tenure uh, until Putin came around. Um, this is the period of Vietnam War and then through uh, the period of leading into Reagan's uh, presidency. Uh, and then Andropov and then Cher 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 Chernenko. These were very quick successions, followed by Gorbachev, who was basically the counterpart to, to Reagan. And it was these two people that worked hard against each other. Um, and it was during Gorbachev that the Soviet Union lost its control of all of its sphere of influence. There was uh, rebellions around the globe and the Soviet Union dissolved and then became uh, the Federation of Russia or, or known just known as Russia today. So, um, I just wanted to show you this uh, succession of people during this period of time. And the space race took, uh, took hold during uh, late 50s to the early 70s. And last but not least, we have the doomsday clock. The doomsday clock is something that was invented uh, in 1947 by a group of scientists shortly after uh, the bombing of uh, Japan. Um, was what motivated it. But that happened in August of 45. And uh, this is Doomsday Clock was published in 1947. Um, it was originally set as seven minutes to midnight, as you can see here, where midnight means basically we've had mutual destruction of a Holocaust. And so basically it's an indication of how close are we to midnight. And it started at seven minutes. It went down in 1953. Um, this is because the Soviet Union had tested nuclear bombs. Then things seemed to thaw out a little bit, um, ups and downs here. And then in the 80s, uh, it really kind of came back down close to midnight again. A lot of this was because of the posturing of the United States at the beginning of the 80s uh, under the Reagan administration. And the United States really toughened its rhetoric um, and started putting money into programs that were considered to be hostile by the Soviet Union, then uh, things begin to thaw out and um, the Berlin wall, wall fell in 1989. And there was this warming of Europe and the, and, and the, the worlds that uh, gained uh, power, uh, I should say sovereignty, uh, separate from the Soviet Union, which now became 
Russia. And so in 1999, 1991, when, when Clinton uh, was president, I'm sorry, when George uh, Herbert Walker Bush was president after Reagan, was when we had our best uh, cooling of the Cold War. And uh, we're here now at 17 minutes to midnight. And that's the furthest the clock has been set back, 1991. It has slowly climbed over the 90s, OK? Uh, somewhere in here, 9-11 happened. And then uh, there's a risk from climate change was incorporated into um, the Holocaust, or if you will, that now that we're um, not just including nuclear uh, possibilities, but also other ways of destroying the ability for humanity to, to continue to live and thrive on the earth. And so again, a couple bit of bubblings. And then here the clock was uh, set to its closest level of midnight ever. Uh, right here in 2020. And so congratulations. Uh, after all of this ups and downs, you now uh, live in your young life when uh, these people who assess the danger of being alive today consider it to be the most dangerous time to ever be alive. Congratulations. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry to give you that news. I'd like to offer you um, better news than that. So on that lovely note that we're going to end on, um, I just want to say that um, it's it's really interesting how that's a, the the doomsday clock is in stark contrast to those graphs I showed you at the end of module one that basically said this is the best time and most optimistic time to be on the planet because you know the child mortality rate is the highest, the education rates are the highest, the uh, number of people that are in abject poverty is the lowest ever, uh, vaccinations are at their highest, so the disease is at its lowest, um, and technology and science are at its highest, but yet we're at each other's throats with people that are embracing conspiracy theories um, and rejecting science and um, a group of people that are becoming quite um, militia minded that want to continue the power structure that came out of the sea race, if you will, um, where there's clear control um, by the group of people that you know had expanded imperialistically and therefore have had control for the last several hundred years. They, these people don't want to lose it. And I don't know how it's going to play out. But that's far afield from what the class topic is really about, which is the space race. And um, we're going to talk about Project Mercury when we come back and the first humans in space. And we're going to talk about Project Gemini, the first uh, actual um, piloting of spacecraft, if you will, um, in space and learning how to do that. So I hope this wasn't too depressing of a lecture and I hope you stuck around for the whole thing and um, we'll see you around next time when we come back for Project Mercury. Mercury, thank you.